90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau and welcome to Law You Should Know. My special guest today is Eleanor Vail. She is an attorney and also the author of Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare. So we're going to talk about relationships and how the law is involved and marriage and and mating after Medicare. Eleanor, welcome to Law You Should Know. Thank you, uh, Ken. It's delightful to be here and combining my two favorite careers. And I, I know that you're a lawyer and you concentrate in helping people to uh, do things to protect themselves if they get married or have relationships after when they're older or after Medicare kicks in. And as a lawyer, how did you become interested in that particular chapter of life? As a lawyer, I became interested because I began to live that chapter of life. It's in law is very interesting, you know, there's law for everything in life. And as we get older, it, there's law for that for every stage of life. And when I went into law, um, I started doing real estate law because that was my previous career. I had been a, a broker and then I branched into personal injury and then I branched into um, other kinds of law, defamation, other things. But I got. A, I'm, I'm. I'm older now. I'm 20 years older, and um, my husband died, and I started dating again. And believe it or not, I started dating at 74 years old. I wrote the book, and it became the book is not only just dating, but it's a journey into older people how they establish relationships after 65 years old. And lo and behold, there came in law again. There, there are situations, there's a particular type of law that older people need or should have or should be aware of if they're establishing new relationships uh, at that age. And it's a very interesting book and a very interesting topic for all those reasons. And, and you yourself, you know, have, have experienced it and you have an expertise because you're are a lawyer as well. What are some of the reasons? I guess it's longevity. People are living much longer today. They're healthier. They retire. They have chance for, for second and third careers and second and third adventures. What, what else has led to that trend? Well, the trend for law as we're older is the fact that we have more assets. We have, and we have more complicated relationships because we have children who are aware of the fact that we have some assets that uh, should be inherited or maybe not inherited or should be shared. So there's, that's the one uh, 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 thing that that's sort of uh, financially true. The other thing is that um, psychologically, we are seen by our younger kids as getting weaker mentally, whether we're lawyers or whatever we do after 65, we're facing old age, we're facing decline. Even though, you know, we're living longer, we're facing a decline. And people are not sure whether we're making decisions um, that they would agree with. They, they worry about the decisions we make. And so here you are, you have an older parent who has become single because his wife has died or maybe even divorced now. And he or she is dating. And you have 25-year-old, 30-year-old kids aware of, of, all, of all the things that can happen and go wrong in a second marriage or a second relationship. And also, whether the, their parent marries can affect their estate and, the, you know, and their future, their economic future, the futures of their children and, and even grandchildren. So it, 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 it correlates with the... Um, the inheritance and the resources of the 
extended family. Yeah, you know, Ken, I went through this, and I it actually broke up my, my first relationship. And this is really what I want to share with you, your audience, as a lawyer, about people who are getting reestablished or remarried uh, as older. You know, we have to be careful because we're not only guys, gals who know the law, but we're interfering. And we're interfering, or we're getting, we're becoming a part of, of a family relationship, uh, and and we're giving counsel to folks that could really destroy a relationship that they've established. So there are economic and psychology and sociology issues. There's also a delicate economic balance between the between the partners in a relationship, regardless of whether they're married. What are some caveats and what are some things that can trigger problems, regardless well, of whether the people get married? I'm sorry, what was the last no, part? Even if, if two seniors are dating and right. they're not quite married, what are some economic issues that can affect their relationship that they should discuss or work out a verbal agreement for, or et cetera? Well, you know, a lot of them don't like to talk about it. They, they, you know, money is a ho- funny subject to talk about. So you kind of try to size up uh, other folks. And then, you know, there are, w- when you're forming a relationship, seriously, does a guy really need to keep treating the woman all the time? You know, when you're, when, nowadays, uh, nowadays it's true, even when you're younger, people just split the check. In the old days, the boy would date the girl and take her out, and maybe she would reciprocate in a different way. But nowadays, there's a, there's a question of who pays for what and how do you split it, whether you're dating or mating or living or not living together. Now, whichever way it goes, should they be able to split it, let's say a meal, entertainment, travel, housing, or if one person really likes the other, should they uh, treat the other person if it brings them other kinds of en- enjoyment or compar- companionship? Yes, there are there, there are issues today with adults that younger folks don't think about, about how you split and how, how it works out legally and what you're entitled to. And it comes to a very personal thing. And then if, if you do something formal, if you end up living together or going together, uh, th- Society imposes some um, some issues on you, and if you don't have a lawyer to to handle it, you can get some pretty. You can, you can be surprised. You can be really surprised. So you you need to you need to talk to a lawyer somewhere along the way if you're going to establish another relationship. And if the people cannot work out the ground rules, can they talk to a mediator or a social worker to help someone? Assuming they, they really have a strong desire to uh, cohabitate or perhaps even get married, maybe someone can work out the parameters or the terms of the relationship, the economic terms? I don't think anyone should work it out for you. Okay. I think what they need to do is have a very subtle role and be there for counseling and let the two people discuss what they want. And I can be more concrete with you because I interviewed about 100 folks in varying stages of, of reestablishing a relationship. And I went through it too. Let's talk about, let's be specific. You want to live, you want to live with someone, okay? You've established a relationship and you don't really feel comfortable about living with someone in case something happens to you and you die. Are, are they entitled to anything? So you, you really need to discuss that and actually write it down because in some states, if you've lived with someone for a while, they call it palimony, and you're entitled to part of the estate just by consecutive living. And, and you may and you may want that you or your children or your family may want that waived if it can be waived, and that may be a mutual something that both parties want. Yes, so it's, so it's subtle. Not only do you need to know the law, but you need know to know how to approach it because. People may be, may, they may disagree. They may, they, they may be, may be waived, but one part may not waive it. A woman moves in with you, Ken, okay? And uh, she, and it's in a state where there's palimony. If she lives with you for five years, she's entitled to a third of your estate automatically, whether you're included in her will or you die in test state. 
because you've lived together. Well, she may may not want to waive that. And what if, what if you're um, even before you reach that point, and you've studied couples and you've written about them? Is it important that each the the man and the woman be economically independent, or is it okay if one is uh, wealthy or has more assets than the other? Well, you know, Ken, that's where my book comes in because I lived through sixty five to seventy five and eighty, and I found a hundred percent of the folks want each other to be economically independent. In other words. Uh, um, if I uh, I don't want I didn't want to meet someone uh, who I would have to support at this stage of my life, and the way it was explained to me by one of the men who had raised two kids and had gotten divorced at sixty five years old, he said I have to have a woman who's financially independent. And she has to prove it to me by sharing in everything if I'm to live with her again. So I said, well, why? He said, because I've done it, I've been there, I've done that, I've raised kids, I've taken care of a wife, yes, she helped out, but it was my responsibility, I'm not going to go there again. I don't want it to happen again. And what if someone's not in a position to provide to financial independence for themselves, but what if they, you know, they provide nurture and love and caretaking? Is that a substitute? I interviewed over 100 people, not one of them said that. But were those people all all independently, financially, have sufficient assets? No, they wanted to meet someone who had assets as much as they did, at least, if not more, if not more. And there had to be a balance. But in all honesty, I have a chapter in my book. What has love got to do with it? So love may override some of those issues. Sometimes, but at an older age... The financial issues are very important. That's why it's so important to have a lawyer. To and have also a, the financial know. issues preserve your own independence. So if it's not working out, you can take a step back or change the arrangement or end the arrangement. If you're financially dependent on someone, it can lead to other, you know, un, uh, maybe inappropriate behaviors or uh, situations. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, and, yeah, and also you... So we're talking about daily living, and I, when I've done prenuptials, where where or or pre living agreement, I've actually drawn up a pre living agreement. It's not even marriage; they're living together. I have been asked. By the way, you have to be very careful. I have been asked to write up how they will share in expenses, and I swear on a Bible that I actually was asked that they would have their own telephone lines. And they would each pay, pay their own telephone bills. So, and, and the same might be true for their own health insurance, th- their own uh, cultural memberships, things along that line. And oh, maybe absolutely. a contribution to the rent or household expenses. Yes, and they have to decide how, and they want that written down, a lot of them. a lot of they're, they're, There are folks who say, we'll work it out. But you find as an older crowd, they really want the structure of a document that says, yes, they'll share, they'll, they'll, they'll sit down at the end of the month and they'll divvy up the expenses or, they'll, or they'll, ha- they'll open a third account, a joint account. They'll have a separate, you'll have an account, she'll have an account, and they'll each put in a certain amount of money. And then you can escalate a course, clause. Some of it's very detailed. I've done some very detailed living arrangement agreement. So it's important. Most people want to preserve their own assets, their own credit, their own, uh, let's say, real estate holdings, and just contribute to the the common household and and living expense situation. Yes. And and, and they also want to be sure that they're not taken for a ride necessarily on just living expenses. They don't want, you know, they want to be sure they're not, they're not actually um, uh, responsible for their their girlfriend, mostly it's male female. Her her need to shop, whatever it is. They right, do. they don't want to co-sign a loan or a car lease or a credit card because they could be financially liable for it. Yeah, you know, okay, I find that true about married couples too. By the way, <laughs> right. I just want to remind our listeners we're listening to Eleanor Vale, and she's an attorney and also the author of. 
a book that talks about marriage after Medicare, and it covers the secrets of dating and mating after Medicare. As you've heard, there are many different issues there. She's She deals with the psychological, the sociological, and of course, the legal issues in her book. It's very interesting. As you've heard, she's interviewed many of the seniors. What are the non-legal issues that you cover in your book? And of course, we want to keep it G-rated for this program. Yeah. Well, I would like to tell my story. Uh, Absolutely. Go ahead. A little bit about how money, money actually broke up my, my relationship. And that became the basis of my chapter. But how it happened to me. Now, I was 74, a practicing lawyer when my husband passed away. And I met a lovely gentleman about three months after my husband passed away through a club that I belonged to. We were mutually introduced and we became a couple. And he had a house in the Hamptons. I'm a practicing attorney. He was retired. He he had enough money. I had enough money. Everything seemed to go. Everything fine. And we got engaged. And by the way, he had four children and they loved me. They, you know, she, he was a widower. So I was like, um, so it was a perfect relationship. I was lucky. I was lucky. Well, the minute I got the ring on my finger, his kids started texting him and calling him, Dad, don't get married. Don't get married. Whatever you do, treat her like a girlfriend. You don't need to get married. And, 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 and I was shocked, frankly. And he ended up, and they didn't say why exactly. They just obviously did not want us to co-mingle any more than we were doing. And I was so insulted by it. First, then then we decided we would do a prenuptial, I'm sorry, because the kids seemed to want it. And as a lawyer, I wasn't even thinking of it, to be honest. You know, to get remarried and to do a prenuptial sounds a little bit crass. We're still living in the age where we should be romantic and do it for love. So even as a lawyer, I had not brought up a prenuptial. But when the kids got involved, his kids, we wrote a prenuptial. I hired an attorney and he hired an attorney and we were paying our own attorney bills. And we we had so many arguments about how to divide assets about living expenses And it got to the point where how often we would have a housekeeper come clean the apartment. And he said he would chip in if we had one every four weeks. But if we had one more than every four weeks, I would have to pick up the rest of the tab. So obviously that was a very detailed um, arrangement uh, trying to address, you know, let's say more minor concerns. (laughs) But some some agreements are like that. Yeah, but I didn't. But I felt I was insulted by it, and I said, and I started saying I refuse to to do it. I said we're going to break it and keep our anyway. It, it, it ended up I gave him his ring back. I broke up with him, and actually now I'm rebonded with someone else. But I'm not. I'm not going to live with him. I'm not going to move in, and I'm not going to worry about sharing expenses. I learned my lesson. You do also in your book, you do cover secrets of dating. And you know, aside from people before they get involved, obviously someone wants to use caution if they're meeting someone online or through some other means rather than in person or through a friend because you really don't know who that person is or if they have a, an ulterior uh, intentions. In the old days, we used to use Dun & Bradstreet to check up on pit folks. Now it's impossible. I, I get I get emails for through my website. By the way, it's an interesting website. I'll tell you readers about your, your, your listeners about in a minute. But I get emails all the time from women who saying, I think I'm being scammed. What do you think? And uh, older folks really have to worry about it. And you pick up telltales when they start talking about money or they start talking about because they're, they're, they're after money. Uh, they start talking about, you know, what kind of car do you drive? Do you drive a car? What do you do in your free time? They're trying to size you up. The only advice I can give was is be very skeptical when you meet someone new and be very careful and do everything very slowly. And if they also they say they need a loan or emergency or a credit card, that's usually a red flag. And you'd be amazed how many 65-year-olds do it. And you would think they would have learned something by now, right? Right. So I just want to remind our listeners, 
We're talking with Eleanor Vail. She's the author of Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare. The book covers some legal concerns of meeting or living with or marrying someone after 65, and, and she's addressed many of those. Many more are covered in the book. What are some other secrets, not necessarily the legal aspect, that you cover in your book and, and tips that you offer people? Uh, well, about dating. Uh, simply dating when you're older is you have to be careful and you have to follow your head more than your heart, uh, especially when you're older. And uh, basically, it's a very positive book because I came across people who are very happy they allow themselves to take risks. Uh, you know, as a lawyer, I, you, you try to say you, you take risks, but you have to sort of control them. But as a person, we are living longer. You brought that up. And we do want a relationship with someone we're chemically attached to. And we, we need to take risks for it. And the book explains how people have done it, how they met, and, and how, they're, how they're navigating it, how they're navigating it. And you profile many different couples and many different relationships. You all, all offer legal guidance based on some of the topics we've covered today and some of these issues to prevent the problem but enjoy that period of life. Uh, just tell us about your website well, my and website, what information you have there. My website grew out of my book, which my, and my book grew out of my personal experience. So my website is t- is more than just dating and mating after Medicare. It's called resetmyclock.com. And it's really geared to people who find themselves 60, 65, who have been out of think usually because they were married and now they're divorced or they're, they're alone because of being, becoming a widow. And they need to get back into the world. And I have, you know, a section on health. I have a section on dating. I have a section on travel, and I have, and I think I'm going to uh, add a section on legal. You know, I think it's part of uh, the aging process that we have to become aware of. It's if people, you know, should be aware of it. What are the, What should be the appropriate role of children if they're concerned? <laughs> you know, of what's what is the uh, just keeping track of versus interference. What's the proper role for children or grandchildren? And that's why it's good for children or, or grandchildren to read this book as well, so they understand your perspective and the perspective of their parent or grandparent. Yeah, well, I'll start with the end, co- your end comment and work backwards. I made my grandkids read it. <laughs> and my oldest grandkid is 23, and my, my middle one is 21, and the youngest one is 16. So I, I made them read the book, and uh, some of them wrote reviews, and some of them didn't. But actually, what, what the book is talking about is uh, the, all the facets of, uh, of dating and, and forming relationships after 65. And I, I actually talk about, um, what well, the question would be, what is appropriate for the kids? To be, it, it varies as many as the families. They do fall into basically two two categories: kids who are, are who are somewhat concerned and kids who are very concerned. I met no one who said, "Gee, mom or dad, do what you want. Don't bother me. I have my own life. I love you." So it's it's like concerned and more concerned. So as an adult, as a senior, I'm giving you advice to be prepared. You have your kids too. And what should the seniors, I hate to call anyone senior because, you know, obviously you and, and your readers are young at heart, but what should their response be? Should they have a, a informed discussion about it? Should they give too much, a little bit of detail or should they say it's none of your business? Well, my advice is they listen to what their kids are saying first because the kids will criticize the partner for various reasons. They may say, we just don't want you doing this, mom or dad. Or they may say this person's not right for you. And that's what you've got to listen to. They may know something that you're missing because you're vulnerable. So you have to listen to your kids now. And you really have to listen to them uh, and, and decide where they're coming from. If they're coming from uh, uh, that kind of thing, that's fine. But if they're coming from basically a fear of losing control over you or a fear of not getting your money when you pass away or losing the home or, or 
then you have to sit them down and discuss that with them and tell them point blank, you have a life to live and you're going to use what you need to use and you will not forget them. So that's an important issue that should be brought out, you know, to address their concerns, to address their financial concerns. Yeah, can to explain I, how important it is to you. To your, well, let me tell you that yeah. is what I am doing. What there's been a tremendous spike in guardianships, where adult children are going after guardianships for their older mother or father. And, be, and I, I know it's tracked in the courts. And what the reason is, is that some of the reason is uh, that the father and mother want to get remarried or they want to live with someone. The kids are going for guardianships because they're trying to stop their parent. And you know what's happening in the courts? The parent is hiring his, his own attorney. So, and is that, and is there a compromise where they're guardian of the property or they, you know, they're trying to affect their parents' decision making? They're trying to affect their parents' uh, decision making. And, and you may agree that's an expensive proceeding for all involved. I mean, it can, it can cost thousands for each party, money on experts, and no one might be happy, but perhaps there can be some negotiation or parameters or an agreement, as you mentioned before, a cohabitation agreement a pre- or post-nuptial agreement to cover the, their concerns. You know, I'm bringing it to your re- your listeners' attention, but it breaks my heart to have to see this, that, you know, the only reason these kids are doing it is because they think their dad or mom are crazy for wanting to cohabitate with somebody else. You know, they, they see that as, as a sign of um, of dementia or whatever it is. So it gets very nasty, and uh, I, I just hope that people who read the book and think about it can avoid that. So your <laughs> book will give them the, the view of a, their parent? Yes, yes. And what yes. would you like to tell those kids, those kids of your clients, or you know that it's not dementia, but it's... Well, I tell them to read my book and say, look, kids... Your, your father, your mother have a life. There are many hundreds of people our age group because of longevity, better health, uh, the Internet, whatever it is. We have our own life. And, you know, get with the program. Don't be don't be such pricks. And we don't be. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, and I'm trying to do that with my website. I'm really on. Okay. A and just tell us your website again. Oh, it's called Reset My Clock dot com. And I get emails. I get emails from people asking me questions. One asked me for a lawyer the other day. The name of your book, which is very interesting to all these groups, is Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare. And your website is Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare.com. I'd like to remind our listeners if you missed part of the program and you want to recommend it to someone else, it's available as a podcast at nccradio.org, along with many other programs about various aspects of the law. I'd like to thank our guest, Eleanor Vale, for being our guest on Law You Should Know. Thank you, Ken. It was a delight to be with you. Remember, it's not intent, this program is not intended to give any legal information, but just provide information on these legal and social concerns. Please join us again next week on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nashville Community College, for another program on Law You Should Know.